Welcome everyone. My name is Neil Bawa. I'll be your host today. Let me get a quick pointer here. That's me up here. I am your presenter and I run two companies. That's Multifamily U, which is an educational company which is running this webinar, and then Grow Capitus, which is an investment company that is um, that basically buys a multifamily and student housing projects. Um, my current portfolio is about a, oops, there we go, is about a thousand units, uh, multifamily and student housing mix. On the multifamily side, a 380, not unit, but bed housing conversion in Las Vegas is complete. And we're also building from scratch a new 322 unit project, 355 beds, and that's in uh, in Buffalo. So I speak at uh, events across the country. There's about 4,000 students that event, uh, attend my multifamily seminars each year, uh, and they attend that through uh, this website, multifamilyu.com. There's over a dozen uh, content-rich webinars there. So welcome, everyone, and uh, hopefully if you live in the Bay Area, you are also joining the Bay Area Multifamily Group, which has over 3,500 members, and there are presentations, face-to-face -face presentations in the Bay Area. For example, tomorrow night, I'm teaching the San Francisco Bay Area Health Check presentation in San Francisco, and there's, um, there are, I believe, about 200 people signed up for that one. So let's start off with our presentation for today, and that is why student housing? Well, the, the simple answer is because it outperformed everything, including multifamily, in the last recession. Let me, let me get a different highlighter. There. So even multifamily didn't do as well in the Great Recession and the, 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 the few years following it than student housing. Now keep in mind, multifamily will probably do better than student housing in good times, and so will retail and industrial and all of the other stuff that's mentioned on this page. They will do better. But today, we are sensitive to the fact that there is a possible recession coming. Oops, I, I hear from one of you that sound is a bit scratchy. Let's see if we can improve that. All right, can someone let me know if my sound is better? How's this? Yes, no, thumbs up? Still scratchy? Okay, all right. Let me see, I'm gonna unplug and plug it back in. All right, let's check that again. Perfect, all right, so let's get, let's keep going. So, what, let's talk about what student housing is, right? These are two obvious words, student housing. But what student housing really means is off-campus student housing, right? So that's really the word that we should be using. It's off-campus student housing, right? And I'm going to give you a little graph that basically shows that. Here's your university campus, right? So this is the campus itself. This Big area here is the university town. It's the area where there's lots of essential services. There's restaurants for millennials and those sorts of things. And then there's on-campus student housing, which is part of the university campus, right? So that's where the university um, has its uh, housing. It's always university owned and typically university managed. And it's only marketed to students for the university's needs, which typically tends to be freshman housing or honors housing. They don't tend to focus on anything beyond that level because that, that's what meets their needs. They need to bring in students. And so they build the minimum amount of housing necessary to house the freshman students. Now, off-campus student housing, and let's take a look at these, see all these properties here. These are always, almost always privately owned, privately managed, and they're marketed primarily towards students. I use the word primarily because sometimes, in certain cases, these properties may also be, pro be marketed towards multifamily folks, right, in certain cases. And there, there are usually some sorts of restrictions so that you don't end up in a scenario where there's 20 kids running around a pool, right? So, so they, they might be for singles, 
that are not students, but in a certain age group, there's, a, there's many properties that do that. So primarily those students live in this property, in these off-campus student housing properties, right? So traditionally, let's say back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, student housing was one lease for all roommates, right? Usually was unfurnished. And then the utilities were in the one tenant's name that was signing onto the lease and was directly paid by that particular tenant and was a mix of families and, and single students that sort of lived there, right? So that was the traditional student housing. And it really started to change around 1999 when custom built, we call them purpose built student housing became popular, right? So when that happened, now things have changed. This is what, this is an example of an actual building that is called 13th and Olive, right? So it's a student housing property where each tenant has an individual lease and they're not renting by the unit, they're renting by the bed. And the vast majority of purpose-built student housing properties in the US are furnished. The utilities are in the landlord's name and they're paid by the landlord. Electricity, gas, landscaping, all of that is paid by the landlord and all tenants are generally single and generally students. So 80, 90% of them are single and students, I'd say probably 95%. And that's what purpose-built student housing is. And since 1999, it has grown. And since 2011, it has become an institutional class. So before that, student housing was primarily small landlords, individual landlords, small groups like us. But since 2011, uh, institutional buyers have started to buy student housing so much so that the cap rates for student housing now are almost at the same level as multifamily. There's a very, very tiny difference between the two, but one could make a general statement and say student housing is just about as expensive as multifamily and that wouldn't be wrong. So here's the difference, right? Firstly, there is the concept of bed bath parity, bed bath parity. What that means, one bathroom for each bedroom. So if you have student housing where you have one, one units, you've got one bed, one bath, right? Uh, two twos, again, two bed, two bath, three threes, and then quads. These are the four different kinds of housing that you typically get where student housing is involved. Now, as you can imagine, what people really prefer is two twos, because if it's one one, it's no different from an apartment, right? So it's, it's the only thing different is that it's furnished and, and, and you know, internet's available. But two two gives you some economies of scale. You're saving some money over buying your own apartment, but you're still getting the benefit of the common area. Three threes are generally seen in more expensive markets and quads are almost exclusively seen in super expensive markets like San Francisco, right? So here's an example. This, this of course, is one of the four units right there. So you see a unit here, you see another unit here, and notice that each unit has its own bathroom. And then right here, this is all the common space, right? So this is shared between all of these four, four people because this, this picture is that of a quad. Now, unit mix for different types, as you can imagine, is, is you know, different, um, different sizes. So the one ones or studios generally work better for seniors. The townhomes generally work better for juniors. And then the three threes and the quads work well for the freshmen and the sophomores. That's what, he, that's what we typically see. Now let's talk about lease terms, right? So lease terms, well, the annual lease, there's, it's an annual lease. It's not a monthly lease, it's an annual lease and has 12 equal payments, not 10 payments. You might say, well, but the students are gone in, in June and July, they're not there. Then, then why would you make 12 equal payments? The answer is that the, for cash flow reasons, you sign a 12 month contract even though you're there for 10 months, which means that they actually have a good chance to fix stuff up. This is one of the benefits of uh, being a student housing landlord, that in May and June, July, fixing stuff is very easy because the property is mostly empty. So you can go into units and fix stuff that typically would take two or three or four or five days to fix. Something that might require you to dig into multiple units is easy to do because the property is empty. Now the leases are usually from August 15th to July 31st. And there's parental guarantees, not all the time, but they're very common. So it's very common for parents to guarantee the leases. Now, this is not something that's well known, but companies like, like us that do structured student housing, 
at a large scale really, really drive the students towards parental guarantees. Because at that point, we're not worried about the, the students destroying stuff because their parents are on the lease. So they're very careful about making sure that the property is well kept and that they're not trashing it. There's one lease per person, not one lease per unit, right? So in a quad, you're actually dealing with four leases. Now this is a downside of student housing because if you have a hundred units and each unit has four people, you're actually dealing with 400 leases, which means that you're dealing with 400 people. So that there's a lot more transactions in student housing than there are in multifamily. Now, some of the unique features of student housing, one is that you need property management software that is designed for student housing. So here are three of the software that are designed for student housing or have student housing modules. So you'd, you'd have to buy those modules because of the whole concept of one unit and having two leases, three leases or four leases. So that's, that, that's something that really needs to be you know, addressed. So here are some of the key features. One is roommate matching, right? So what you're doing is you're using an online portal to offer a roommate matching service where people go in, they, they provide the courses that they're interested in, their age, their sex, those sorts of things, allowing people to, to you know, pick roommates. There's a student portal which has lots of information like um, you know, there's inf information about the university, there's information about what's happening um, nearby, there's, there's study, uh, area information, those sorts of things. There's a portal for the parents because they're the ones on the lease. So if the student is delinquent, not paying rent, those sorts of things, this, the parent can come in and check. There's always online payments and leasing because typically students want to pay online. And of course, the standard maintenance requests are also built into those softwares. The other unique uh, piece or key issue in considering student housing is that you need a property manager that specializes in student housing. This is really, really important. You do not want to buy a student housing property and put a multifamily property manager in charge. He's going to do an absolutely terrible job. So the, the right property manager knows that the environment he has to create is this environment, right? Which is the, the, the study environment not the frat party environment. So if you have a multifamily property manager that's managing your student housing, you might end up with this kind of frat party, which, which is very expensive from your perspective. And, and there's lots of challenges. So the key thing is that you need to have a property manager that enforces peaceful enjoyment. The concept of peaceful enjoyment is when you're inside of your own unit, do what you like, don't you know, don't disturb others with noise. But when you're inside this blue section, you are part, you, the, the lease is being enforced because there's an enforced lease and that lease is not just between the landlord and the student, but it's also between the roommates. Now, because the, the lease involves a roommate, it's very, very important for there to be peaceful uh, enjoyment. Also, one unique feature of the lease is that the common area actually extends into the unit. One of the other things that a, a strong student housing property manager will do is that they will deal with helicopter parents. So these are people that, uh, parents who basically, now that they've signed the loan, feel that it is necessary for, for them to call the property manager every single day and talk with the property manager about everything that's going on with their children, where they start believing that the property manager somehow is the student's nanny. And so you need a property manager that knows how to deal with those kinds of helicopter students. In fact, if you're getting bigger loans from Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae for student housing, they might actually require you to have a, a property management company that specializes just in student housing. In fact, the CEO of the largest student housing company in the US, Bill Bayless, he's the CEO of American Campus Community, says that the property manager is the most important factor in student housing. And I could not agree more because what the property manager does there is that they promote resident socialization and it's resident programming, not animal house, right? So you're, you're trying to stay away from this and that, and you do that through 
re resident socialization, right? So a good property manager will do stuff like Taco Tuesdays and tailgate parties. They'll do pet a puppy. They'll do pancakes and PJs. They'll do poolside cabanas. They'll do all of that because the students are going to party anyway. You might as well bring some structure to this process, right? The students bring the food. They bring, uh, you know, so it's not like you're spending a great deal of money, but what you're doing is you're structuring it. And because you're structuring it and it's your party, you're setting the rules. And that's very key. Now, so we talked about some of the unique features and some of the unique factors. Now let's talk about markets, right? What are the key issues in considering a market for student housing? If you're buying for yourself or you're buying for your investors, what are some of the factors that you wanna consider? Well, you've really got to understand the university first, right? Is this a residential university? Is this a commuter university? Are people coming in from the outside? If 80 or 90% of the students that, that are at this university are going to be local residents, well, there, there isn't a lot of room for you. So you want something where a lot of the students are actually coming in from the outside. Then we look at private versus public, right? And there's X factors there. So if it's a prestigious private school where students are coming in from the outside again, you're going to see good numbers. On the public side, right? Is this a university that where the, the average student can actually afford the sort of structured student housing you're putting in? Because it's not cheap, right? It's a, not a low cost option. So make sure that if it's a private university, students are actually able to afford it. Another, another thing is tier one versus community college. So I've seen people buying student housing near community colleges and then really, really suffering. Because what I found is for the most part, student housing does not work well with community colleges. One, because the, the students basically are freshmen at that point in time, they don't have a lot of money. And second, they're going to that community college because it's near their home and they can get the, 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 the cheaper uh, fees. So they're unlikely to come live with you. So be very, very careful. Some of these four, now we have four year community colleges in some states in the US. So be very careful because community colleges don't work well with student housing, even the four year ones. The other piece is location, location, location. You might say, oh, what's new there, right? All real estate is about location, location, location. But no, student housing is hypersensitive to location, location, location. It is more sensitive than multifamily. It is more sensitive than single family because you've really got to understand what is known as the university zone, right? The university zone is basically this area that's close to the campus, right? Where you can get to campus easily. Maybe there you're one bus stop away. Maybe you have a, a bike lane that comes into the university. So it may not be though, it may not be you notice that this, this graph is a little bit odd shaped and I designed it that way because the university zone might only extend 100 yards in this direction, but it might actually extend 500 yards in that direction. The only way to know for sure is to drive the area. You don't wanna do this on Google because Google doesn't really give you, Google Maps doesn't give you a feel for whether this is the university zone. By looking at the shops, by looking at the people walking around, by looking at the way that, that, that uh, goods are being pitched and the restaurants, by just walking into restaurants, you'll know what the zone is like. I've never seen the zone to be like this. It's, it's never exactly around the university. It always varies and you really need to understand that, right? Keep in mind that closer is better. In fact, with student housing, cap rates go down, which means prices go down, go up as you get closer to the university. So if you're sharing a property line with the university, people will be willing to pay a lot more for your property than when if you're a mile away. So keep that in mind. You might see a really, really good deal, but it might be a mile away. Well, the students might not want to go that far. So try and stay within 500 yards of a property line of the university, right? Keep in mind, as Mark Felberg said, students want to be at college, they don't want to go to college, right? So your, your property uh, needs to be part of that university or student zone, right? So the next thing that you want to look at when you're considering the market is, you're looking at student population increases. Now, where do you get this information? Actually, it's, it's fairly simple. Most universities have projections of student housing, I'm sorry, student populations, 
but most universities will exaggerate them because they want funding, so they tend to exaggerate it. So what you want to do is you want to look at the last four or five years of growth for a particular university and extrapolate that. You can get that from the university's website, and if not, you can call the university. They'll direct you to a department that helps with those kinds of things. They usually have a public relations type department, and they will give you the numbers for the last four or five years and extrapolate those. Be careful about just using projections off the university's website. A lot of those are designed just for so that the university can get more funding from the city or the state. Um, the other piece of it is employee population. You want to you want to go into places that are growing. So overall. Your, your interest is in population growth. You, you know, if you can go into a, a, an area that has at least two, two and a half percent annualized growth, you're going to do fairly well in terms of your student housing as well, because the, the two and a half percent population growth will create two and a half percent more in students every year, and that's a pretty good number. So let's look at all the different grades of student housing, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures. So. The, the most expensive kind are called core class A. Once again, they're not class A, they're core class A. And here's an example of what a core class A building looks like. So a core class A is just everything you can imagine. Every kind of services, there's sauna, there's, there's uh, you know, free massages available, uh, there, there's wellness. You, you name it, you've got it, really expensive class A properties. And these typically tend to have at least one property line touching the university itself, so students can just walk there. Um, class A, so here's a typical class A. Um, not as good looking, not as many services, but still pretty premium and pretty pricey. And then class B, uh, properties, they look like standard multifamily, so you might, you might not be able to tell them apart from a standard multifamily unless you were inside. And then class C are basically old multifamily properties that have been converted over to student housing. So they don't, they don't look any different at all. So class A and B, you definitely, as soon as you walk in, you can tell the difference. They're very trendy. They've got these, they look a little bit like walking into Google, right? So if you walk into Google or walk into the Salesforce office, you're gonna see the bright colors, the glass and, you know, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, you will see them in core class A and class B, class A but not in class B or in class C as much. One of the other things to think about is that with students, perception is everything. This is an extremely emotional group that's constantly thinking about other people. What my friends think I do, what my parents think I do, what companies think I do, what teachers think I do, and then finally, what I think I do right? They are very hyper attentive to what other people are thinking about them. So one of the key things is you may not want to buy a property, even if it's close by, if it has a really bad reputation. So maybe it's a property that there are some students living in it and you look at Yelp and the, and the reviews are one star, like this particular property. Um, this, is, this is in Provo. So this was a property that had really, really bad reviews. And uh, a friend of mine, Dave uh, Freeman, bought this property and struggled with it for nearly a year and a half because he was doing everything right. The property was well priced. It was well positioned. It was close to the university. He was doing everything right. But the problem was students didn't want to live there. They didn't want their parents to think they were living there. They didn't want their friends to know that they were living there. So what Dave did was he stopped his interior rehab and he redirected his, his money to rebranding the outside. So this is, this is a pre-picture of the property. The post-picture looked very slick. Basically what he did was he just changed everything about the property using completely different colors, using completely different signs, a different name, and and that allowed him to get off of the one star Yelp review bandwagon. And the moment he did that, for the same price, for the same units, no rehabs, no upgrades, he was able to raise rents greatly. So perception is reality when it comes to students, though they do care about other things like amenities. And in, a, in core class A, you know, in, 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 the, in the super class A, you're seeing these kinds of things. And you might see in, in class A, you might see lounges like this. These days we're seeing, believe it or not, wellness stuff, Zen gardens, meditation rooms, VR rooms. But the, the, the sort of stuff that you're gonna see in all student housing properties are this, student you know, study areas. You're gonna see some sort, um, some sort of pool 
right? Most of them have pools, some, most of them have hot tubs. And then uh, often you'll see barbecue grills and fire pits. But they, again, a lot of the class A will have these kinds of things uh, for students and they're becoming very popular. They're so, and, and also if the property is not close to the university, you might see some kind of a shuttle bus service. So as I said, the, this area is becoming an institutional class. There's a lot of interest. A lot of these companies that I'm about to show you went from 10,000 units to 100,000 units. You look at ACC at the top, they own 100,000 beds in the US. But, and so they're really the king of this market. They really understand the market and they're headquartered in Austin, Texas. But then you see a lot of other players that are between 10,000 beds and 42,000 beds. So really becoming an institutional asset class which is why we believe it's a great time to invest. These are still low numbers. I have to tell you that if I look at multifamily, every single one of these top 10 would be above 100,000 units. So this is, this is still the early days for high. I'd love to take questions. You can, yeah, I can answer questions either on student housing or on multifamily in general. Okay, I see a couple of people typing. So the first, the first question is how, you know, how do you avoid large maintenance levels in student housing? Well, once again, it comes down to the kind of student housing. If you're targeted towards freshmen, you need to budget a higher maintenance budget. Secondly, you need to set a lot of house rules. This is where your property manager comes in, but you need to play a role. You need to set house rules. People need to understand that they can't trash the place and you need to be prepared to throw them out if that happens. One of the nice things about students is everyone knows everybody else in your apartment complex. So if you have 100 students and you throw two of them out on the same day for trashing the units, guess what? By the next week, the remaining 98 will know that the others were thrown out. So not only do you want to make, um, you know, make a case out of those people and make them very visible, you want to actually help spread that information through to, to the other students and let me tell you how you do that. So when you have student housing, you will hire some of your students as resident assistants or RAs. And this goes to the other question that's come in, how do you market them? Well, through the students. So you hire RAs or resident assistants and each day the resident assistants go out into the university and they have you know little uh, three by five pamphlets about your property and they hand those out. They're called guest cards. Now what they do actually is that they don't just hand stuff out. They have people fill out guest cards and they bring those guest cards back to the property where a leasing agent then makes phone calls out on those guest cards to schedule an appointment. So that's how your marketing is done. And the same RAs are going to act as your uh, rumor spreader. They live at they live at the property. Most of the time, you're, you're giving them discounted rooms because that that's how they that's how they get paid discounted rooms. So what they do is basically you 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 know if you if you've evicted a student because they're trashing the place, well you call your RAs and say I'd like to make sure that everybody in the place knows that this particular student got evicted, right? Now you've got to be careful how you say it. You don't want to say something that can get you in trouble. But with minimal amount of information, the RAs will spread that and everybody will know by the next week. Okay, so what kind of cap rate can one achieve with student housing versus multifam? Very good question. The short answer is in the US, there's not much of a cap rate difference between student housing and multifam. So if you're in a market that is a six cap multifamily market, in most cases, that market is going to be a 6.25 cap for student housing. So the cap rates for student housing are one quarter to one half cap higher in most US metros. How do you find suitable PMs who specialize in student housing? Well, it's not very hard actually. Think about it. I mean, you're targeting a certain university, let's say Davis, right? Well, you just have to drive around Davis and, and go Google Davis. There's gonna be five or six student housing communities, big ones around Davis, right? Well, just walk into those units and grab a card for the property manager. And th that property manager is clearly understands how to manage that particular kind of property. Now, do not go into a core A property if you have a class C property. If you have a class C property, go find all of the student housing around. This is much easier than multifamily because 
they've got to be within a half mile of the of the of the uh, uh, property and I'm sorry the university right so how hard can they be defined you definitely have to drive around though okay um, more questions Mm, looks like that was the last question. We will be sending out the recording of this presentation. Uh, hopefully I see uh, you guys tomorrow at my, the most popular presentation of the year for me, which is the San Francisco Bay Area Health Check presentation. And that presentation is going to be um, um, about what's happening in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm going to be going over every city and every county in the Bay Area talking about rent increases and most importantly appreciation. So hopefully you can come. It's in San Francisco next week. It's in Fremont. The week, uh, it, it's in San Francisco tomorrow and it is in Fremont next week. If you want to check that out, go to multifamilyu.com and click on the meetup link and you should be able to see it. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Otherwise, thank you and I'll see you at Multifamily U. Good night.